Hello and welcome everybody uh, to our January 2023 webinar series, the Soil Food Web Movement. This is webinar two, the Soil Food Web Community. And before we get started, uh, as we typically tend to do, we'd like to ask everybody where they're coming from, just to kind of see where our audience is, is at. And uh, the way you can do that, there's a chat button at the bottom of your screen. And go ahead and open up the chat window. And if you could, just uh, go and put where you're coming from. And so I can start to see some folks pop out. Oh, there we go. There's the floodgates are opening up. Mm. Actually, uh, quite a few folks in the US representing today. All right. And then we got our international crowd starting to really come in. A lot of folks from UK I see coming in. Perfect. We'll do this for just about uh, 20 seconds or so, just to let everybody join. It takes a while for everybody to kind of get into the webinar itself. Yeah, as usual, we're getting the, a very uh, large around the world crowd, which I'd love to see. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, let's talk about our January uh, promotional series. And we've already had webinar one, which there's a replay available, and that was Understanding Soil Health. Uh, today is webinar two, which is the Soil Food Web Community. So you're going to hear from uh, myself and my peers as far as what it's like to be a consultant out in the field uh, doing this kind of work. And then webinar three, which will be on Thursday, January 26th. Uh, we're going to have my client, Jen Sir from Sonoterra Farms, talk about her market garden and the impacts that the Soil Food Web practices have made for her. And then on webinar four, we'll be talking about um, um, soil health success stories again about Grass Valley Farms in Montana. And this is going to be with Casey Ernst and Corey Miller, uh, Casey being the, the consultant and Corey being the client. So it's good to be able to see some of these different case studies that we actually have um, and the success stories that, that are happening out in the field. So we hope to see you guys on webinar three and webinar four. And then uh, for our webinar our kind of rules of engagement here, um, as far as the uh, community is concerned, you'll all be in muted mode. That just makes sure that we keep uh, all the background noise and we get good audio quality. Uh, but we still like to be able to interact with you. And so there's really two ways to do that. The first way is to be able to ask questions for the panelists. So if you have a question that you want the panelists to be able to cover, make sure you choose the Q&A button, which again is at the bottom of your screen, and uh, type your question in there. And then if you want to just be able to chat with other attendees, and there's usually a pretty uh, good dialogue, and, and most of you have already used this uh, chat window to type in where you're coming from, uh, go ahead and just uh, chat with inside the chat. And it's really good to be able to, to see that kind of engagement interaction amongst all of you. And other than that, just go ahead and enjoy. So let's talk about uh, today's topics. So we'll be going through some quick introductions, just uh, introducing you to the panelists and, and doing this kind of housekeeping that we're doing now. And then we're going to uh, meet the community. And so we have presentations from Alan Skinner, Keisha and Casey Ernst, Kevin Krause, Casey Williams, and myself. And we're going to be talking about uh, the work that we actually do. And then we'll spend just a, a few minutes talking about our January offer and the promotion that we're running right now. And then we have about 45 minutes of Q&A uh, scheduled. So we're really looking at a total time of about two hours for today's webinar. All right, let's meet our panelists. So Alan, if you want to just give a quick introduction to yourself. Yeah, hello everybody. It's, it's uh, so encouraging to see this international community. It's, it's just incredible what this movement is doing now. Um, my, my, uh, I'm based in Jacksonville, Florida, USA, and I have my own consulting business, but I also work on some other things that are related to the soil uh, food web movement. So that's a quick summary. Thanks, Alan. Keisha and Casey. Hey, I'm Casey, Keisha. Um, we wear kind of a lot of hats. We have a compost company where we produce biologically rich compost for people to use when they're regenerating their soil. Um, and then we also have currently two consulting businesses, but we're trying to consolidate that down into one. Um, where we're actually working with Brian Bogg on a new uh, business venture together. So yeah, we kind of head out and, you know, put the consulting into actual practice. Great. Uh, Kevin. Hi, everybody. Uh, great to be here today with all of you. Uh, I've got a pretty good rundown as I go through my presentation, so I'll, I'll just kind of wait to then to introduce more of what I do, but uh, really happy to be part of the Soil Food Web effort. Thanks, Kevin. And Casey. 
the other Casey. Casey one. Yeah, Casey <laughs> Williams. Um, I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, yeah, I do farming part time and uh, my consulting soil health business and uh, have a newer business where we develop the smart compost thermometers. So there's always, always plenty to do. And I'm uh, Brian Vang. I'm uh, the host for today's webinar. I also own a consulting business, uh, really part of two. And uh, Keisha and Casey and myself uh, will talk about uh, our adventure moving forward. And um, I've actually moved from Northern California up to Oregon. So I, I've kind of translocated myself to another part of the United States. Um, and it's fantastic uh, doing this move and, and getting new clients up in this part of the, the uh, country. And one uh, thing you'll notice uh, today, and in, in, not in today's webinar, is Dr. Elaine Ingham. Uh, she's actually working on a very large part, uh, project out in Southeast Asia, but she decided to leave the, uh, the inmates in, in charge of the asylum. So uh, we're going to do our best uh, without uh, Dr. Elaine today to be able to, to tell you about the Soil Food Web and the things that we do. Okay, uh, we're going to go ahead and start with our first presentation. So Alan, uh, take it away. Okay, again, welcome everybody. Uh, this first slide is a picture of my beautiful mug and uh, contact information. And uh, certainly I'm more than open to hearing, uh, hearing from people if they wanna email me or contact me, I'm more than happy to talk to them if I can fit it into my schedule, but I will find a time to, to speak with you if I can. Uh, again, uh, next, next slide. Okay, a little bit of background on myself. Uh, again, my company's based in Jacksonville, Florida. I actually grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, but I've lived around the country, most in the Southeast. Um, I've, I think like a lot of people in this world, we have a circuitous careers. I uh, started out in mechanical engineering and then transitioned into real estate based on some family uh, assets we had that was based in, in Jacksonville, Florida. And I kind of managed our, our agroforestry agro business in, in Jacksonville, Florida, which I, I've always had a love for the outdoors. We've always we're, our family's been fortunate to have land and we camped out and did a lot of uh, planting of native plants and things like that. Um, so I thought real estate was a great career. So I made that kind of my pursuit. And then of course the great recession happened and found out that was not the case, especially in Florida. Luckily, my uh, boss I worked with was a land planner and had an interest in soil biology. And he got me involved with selling some of the products that they had, which were some of these startup companies like SumaGrow and Quantum Growth that were selling bugs in a jug, as they say, which is basically biology in a, in a jug that you apply to the soil and you get great results. After doing it for several years and kind of make it, since I had time in the recession, um, these products didn't work so good. And I was really upset because the, the manufacturers certainly said they work great. Um, then I talked, got a hold of uh, Dr. Ingham by just finding her, finding her out on YouTube, got an hour of her time and talked to her about it. And she says, well, the problem with those products is that they're, they're even though there's a diversity of organisms, it's essentially a monoculture because there's just not much diversity in these products. And you really need the whole soil food web, which I'm sure you'll hear that term a lot today. And if you want to learn more about this, um, you should take my course. And I said, I'm all in because I love this, this subject. And uh, I wanted to get my whole uh, soil food web certification. So about the time I, I chose my final project, I got asked to pursue a three-year uh, NRCS uh, Conservation Innovation Grant, and I wrote it around Dr. Ingham's program, so it was, it, was a, it was a double whammy, but I ended up studying her methods for three years, and I, I, I did a thousand microscope assessments and wrote a 180-page report. Of course, 90% of that was data pages, but still really proud of that report of, what, of the data we had in showing that her methods do work, and I became a soil food, food web consultant uh, back in June of uh, 2022. Next slide. Yeah, the inspiration, I, I think, uh, you know, I just, once you start getting into this subject, if, you're, if you have a science background like myself, you don't have to have a science background, but it, that certainly helps. You really get just excited and you get, I uh, want to read more and more about it. I found the book, uh, Taming with Microbes, highly recommend it with, from Jeff Lowenfels. Uh, really gave me a good uh, kickstart into that, uh, the, the science. I, I love the environment. And I also, with my, I've got a pretty extensive career background where I dealt with, I was client manager, sales as well as doing actual project management and it all kind of culminated in this in this uh, last i say you know my career here doing soil biology um, but i i uh, it, it excites me to no end to see clients that are happy from what you the advice you give them that really benefits them 
So this career really suits my background with, uh, you know, with learning and science and sales. Next slide, please. Um, what do I do now? I, I really have three aspects of my life. I, I have my small business, which is based around consulting through the Soil Food Web from the education that I got through Dr. Ingham's program, as well as networking with many other people. Um, when I did my three-year report, I did it at White Harvest Farms in Jacksonville, which is really an inner city food desert farm, but it's a real gem of a location. And I had a wonderful staff and, we're, and they all drank the Kool-Aid about what I was teaching them. And it's basically a no-till, uh, you know, biocomplete compost run farm. And, and I just continued to do research out there. And I'm, I was just out there this morning, as a matter of fact. Um, the last thing is I kind of kind of semi-retired and I love traveling with my wife and doing recreation, seeing my kids. Um, my work is really consulting with uh, a lot of different industries. It can be farmers, uh, gardeners, and, la and landscape businesses as well. You got to kind of diversify to maybe fill the funnel full of work. Um, and the implement, I can also, I have certain amount of equipment that I can actually do physical implementation of, of some of my projects. Lastly, so much of what we do in this, in this business requires educating clients because it's really relatively new and not many people know about it. So you do spend yourself spending a lot of time educating people. Next slide, please. Um, so kind of what is my plan for the future is, is to continue to focus on small and medium sized farmers. Uh, big projects tend to consume you. I, 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 I probably would grab one if it was a really good project, but I love helping the small people out because they're the foundation of our culture and keeping our business, our, our economy going. Um, so I consult with, I like to consult, consult with uh, urban farms because I've got some equipment that helps with that. Um, I really do want to eventually scale up and get more uh, biocomplete compost production, which is now actually happening on this uh, farm I work on. Love to mentor others. We just hired somebody at our farm and I'm now mentoring her and she's really picking it up super fast. And also I, I like to speak uh, for at various uh, events as well. Next slide. Uh, what's my passion? Love what I do. You know, it's, it's a science thing. You, you, you tend to get uh, exuberant a little bit. I got, that's, that's my biggest flaw is I tend to get a little too excited. You got to slow down and, and just really speak clearly to everybody. Um, but this is a real win, win, win uh, career because uh, first of all, it really does help people. It helps people financially too, because you can save a lot of money uh, as a farmer by, by getting off the chemical train with fertilizers and pesticides and all that. You also help um, people's health. And lastly, you can sequester carbon and maybe save the planet. So it's, it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing we can do with all these three things. Uh, next slide. Uh, my business, um, basically it's, you know, my clients really love what I do. I, I tend to go a little above and beyond. I, because I'm semi-retired, I can afford to maybe, maybe give them a little more service than they probably would get from a, maybe a, a hardcore salesperson, but, but that makes me happy because I don't want to leave them um, stranded. I want to make sure I'm always there for them, and they really do appreciate that, Since it's, especially since it's such a new field and requires a lot of hand-holding, et cetera. Uh, it's a supplemental income, and, you know, it's, it's, um, it's actually not so, so bad in that department, as a matter of fact. Uh, it may require, you know, teaming up with others, um, but, you know, in terms of a business, um, in turn, if those are considering getting into this business, you know, it is a transition. If you're if you're in some kind of career, you want to transition into this. You know, you always got to make sure you can pay your own bills. So make sure the old saying, "Don't don't quit your day job till the night job pays." You know, and this is kind of a night job until you can make it pay. So always keep that in mind. Uh, you get, if you have a family, you got to take care of them. But but um, I encourage you if you do want to transition into this field, try to try to start getting into the field of of farming or landscaping or or compost making, and then you can offer these additional services and science from what you learn from the, from the classes you take. Um, having a lot of equipment certainly helps, um, but I feel really this is a great career. It's, it's, it's gonna really save the planet, I think, at the end of the, end of the day. Next slide. Um, the topic of this webinar is the Soil Food Web community, and I got to reflect on it when I was getting prepared for this, and I was really overwhelmed by all the different um, tendrils that this does reach. Number one, uh, being a part of this uh, group where you go take the classes and become certified. Um, you do um, actually do network with people quite a bit uh, for many, many levels. Um, the, the, the website is a great tool for me because I get a lot of referrals for my, my business from being on the website. 
Um, and I don't know everything and I, don't, I probably never will. <laughs> um, and so I have to talk to other people around the country that can help me with a special project I'm working on. So, so there's other experts that have already done something that I can rely on. They can help me. Um, I can get from advice, advice from them. And then sometimes we, we, the project may be so big that we may have to team up on a project. And there's one that's uh, may come to fruition. That's a, a huge federal project I'm working on right now that may can't say it will, but it could be a huge project. And there's no way that I can do this by myself. Um, I refer business up to other people and people refer business to me uh, based on maybe geography or maybe uh, ability to do the work with your time. Um, you know, that you, you might need to, to call up another uh, soil food web expert about some, maybe they did a, a federal grant that I've never done before, but maybe they can help me how to do it. Uh, some of the many resources that I contact, this is kind of within our group is, you know, Todd Harrington's in Connecticut with Harrington Organics. He's, he's really got a lot of experience and Keisha's is also in this panel, Keisha and Casey Ernst and uh, Carla Portugal is with my mentor. She's also great. She's got a PhD and has the academic background with it's so helpful. Sammy gets me navigating around the, the community within the Soil Food Web group. And of course, no, no less uh, Dr. Ingham because she's the ultimate really in so many ways. But, I, but I, there's, there's so many other people in this group that I wanna meet and, and network with because there's so much more I wanna learn but there's uh, everybody's got their own skill set, and I, I do want to tap into that. Uh, and I think that pretty much sums up uh, my my talk for for myself. Thanks, Alan. Uh, great. It, it's good to see, especially around the community uh, aspect of it. Um, it. It is a great community for us to be able to to know who your peers are and be able to communicate with them. So I'm glad that you've been able to reach out to to those folks. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, we're going to move to Keisha and Casey. Hey, everybody. I'm Casey. Here's Keisha. <laughs> um, yeah, so we are Catalyst Bio Amendments. Um, we have a few, too many Instagram handles now on the bottom right corner there. Uh, but we, yeah, we do everything from compost production to Keisha runs a, the Soil Microbe Library, which is basically just identification. Um, and then uh, microscope identification. And we've also just started an, um, a new joint venture with Brian and kind of merging our consulting companies together. And that's uh, at Soil Matters. Um, but yeah, you can go to the next slide, Brian. So life before for us, um, there's a few lives before for us. Uh, previous to all this, I was a massage therapist, but um, <laughs> The soil obsession, it became, it began in Ecuador. So we, we kind of realized that we were living our life in a way where we, we wanted to have knowledge about how to grow food, um, you know, just soil in general. We were both really interested in it. And we took off on this grand adventure to go and try and like gather as many skills as we possibly could that were useful for, um, I guess, basically growing plants and, and, and life, right? So we did everything from permaculture, food forest stuff. Um, we had goats, obviously, in the picture, very cute little babies. Um, we did a lot of natural building. And we taught people to do all this. So it was one of these uh, live and learn how to operate while also teaching. And that really ingrained a lot of these skills um, into us. But while we were working on this project, it became um, fairly clear that there was something that would work and or something that would work with the compost that wasn't always present, right? So I could go back to what Alan said, we were reading Teeming with Microbes before we ever left to go to Ecuador. And I think that was probably something that got us out the door. Um, and it was in that book that we got introduced to soil microorganisms, and it was just a basic idea in my head, but it was while we were doing this project that it really locked in. I bet this compost that I'm making that's working so spectacularly well is due to the microbes inside of it, right? So we started taking the soil food classes with Dr. Elaine, um, and I think now it's probably time for me to move to the next slide. Next slide, Brian. <laughs> Um, and so while we were back there in Ecuador, we were doing we were doing the workshops with Elaine. We were kind of leaving the mountain, so to speak, to go down into town where there was power, where we could watch these videos. <laughs> and uh, we decided that we needed to leave Ecuador to meet Elaine. And that's kind of where we got our inspiration to actually start these businesses. Um, we had like already started taking the classes, but 
you know, we came back from Ecuador and immediately just kind of found a lane in any way that we can and just kind of got ourselves in there, just like any class she was hosting um, until we actually then started hosting our own classes. Um, that's what this is here. It was like one of the first things we ever did is like a soil community effort um, with the local people in our area. And you can see in the picture there, right? There's Brian and his wife, Shelby and Elaine and Sammy's there. Like all the people that like, I mean, half the people <laughs> in the webinar today and all the people we still work with today, um, they were our original inspiration. Uh, when we met them, it was just like, yeah, this is our team. Um, this is our support system and our people. And, you know, at that time, the Soil Food Web School wasn't what it is today. And it's just, this community has been growing through the years in ways that I don't think any of us could have imagined. Um, we all kind of, we got started together and we're still, you know, constantly going to each other for help and, and fun too. <laughs> we have a really good time. Next uh, slide, Brian. Um, I guess this is talking about what our daily lives look like now that we've gotten into this. Um, compost facility is, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, it's a lot of, you know, a lot of people look at the job as like, okay, you're out there, you're making compost. You're, and that's like, like 10% of the job, actually. It's like the rest of it is paperwork and county registration and dealing with the water board and designing packaging and labeling. So it's not necessarily all of the micro just you know microscope work and out there like building compost isn't necessarily the majority of that job i think what he's trying to say is composting is is the easy part <laughs> <laughs> i think when we got started and we were like can we do large-scale compost like we were so concerned that we just weren't going to have nematodes or that there wasn't going to be enough fungi in the compost <laughs> um but you know the issues just turn out to be growing uh, growing a biofocused compost company um, and this, you know, today's market, this isn't your typical compost. And so a lot of what we do has to has to do with outreach. Um, but luckily, we finally settled into our our little nook in composting. We feel really confident. Our product is re reliable. We've done lots of testing. And now we've got other folks that we've been able to hire that are, you know, taking over the work that we used to do. And they're becoming, you know, the inspired um, Oh, they're basically running catalysts and coming up with all the good ideas now. And uh, next slide. We've been spending most of our time over the last year, year and a half uh, consulting. And it started out, Casey and I started our own business. We called it Catalyst Consulting. And to be honest, it was a mistake. Um, when <laughs> all of our businesses and all of our emails now line up and, and, and they're the same name. And so it's very, very hard <laughs> to figure out what business I'm talking about. And so <laughs> we actually formed a group and that, that's not the reason, but we formed a group with Brian uh, and his wife, Shelby, because we've been working together like that picture since the very beginning. Um, Catalyst Bio Amendments and this crew has been on together. And so we finally decided, you know what, let's just let's just join forces and we can start to take on these, you know, really, really large projects. And so where when Alan was talking about, he really likes the little projects and we love that too. That's what we started out with was, you know, at home growers, um, landscaping. Now we're ready to take on you know, larger, more challenging projects. And so, um, yeah, it's been fun transitioning from the compost lot to, uh, being a full-time consultant. Next slide. Um, yeah, and then one of the questions we were given for this webinar was like, where do we give our support and where do we receive our support from? And like Keisha has been mentioning, you know, it's a lot of the community that you see on all these webinars that you see in a lot of this promotional material, but it's also from our clientele. Um, you know, like when I first went to like these, a large scale farm, I had never actually done large scale farming. You know, I, I understand that like when you when you walk into a project, you're a microbe farmer. You are not necessarily a corn, wheat, soy farmer. You are not a hay farmer. And so you get a, like our knowledge base is what's going on in the ground. Their farmer's knowledge base is what crop is going in and what the cycles and all that stuff. So it's really neat the support you get from the farmers because you end up starting to learn in on all these different crops that you actually didn't know anything about. And, you know, it's, it's cool because biology is pretty much uniform across the scales as far as like what you need to do to increase it in soil. But I, I like the, my favorite thing actually is the support we get from farmers and just like learning how they do their practices and what kind of things they implement on their farms. Uh, next slide. 
And then, you know, do, do we hang out with Dr. Elaine? What, who is a part of our life in the Soil Food Web School? The Soil, the Soil Food Web School is like, it's almost a part of all of our lives since we got involved with it. Uh, we haven't tried to get rid of them there and, and we haven't managed to, you know, it's there, they're involved with everything. We do webinars with them. We, uh, we work for them. They promote our business to the website. Um, there's always these continuing education classes. I can think of, you know, thing after thing after thing that where we, where we actually connect. Um, and we do get to work with Elaine. Like these are all great photos of just like us in workshops together. But the real truth of it is, is like Elaine's who you interact with all the time when you first get started. Um, for me, it feels like the better we get at our job, the less time we actually get with Elaine. And so now it's more of um, making sure to check in a couple times, you know, every month just socially to say hi. Um, but once you go to the school, you get access to Elaine, you get access to all the mentors and all the students. And so, I mean, it's, it's this awesome community where if you have a question, you go into the, you know, you go into the forum, you go into the Skype group, you ask it, and you're gonna get, you know, 15 different people coming back with amazing ideas. Um, everybody's kind, everybody understands we're all learning and they're just trying to support each other. And then on top of that, like, yeah, you, you get Elaine's answers as well, which are just incredible. She never tires, like she loves this work and uh, it really shows. Uh, next slide. Next slide. That's, it for us. That's the end of it. That's all. Thank you, Keisha and Casey. Great presentation. Love the pictures. Uh, some of those I hadn't seen yet, so that was great. All right, uh, let's go ahead and move on to our next presenter. Uh, Kevin, take it away. Thanks, Brian. Uh, well, I grew up as an Iowa farm kid, and I went off to a military career and retired from that in 2015 with the idea of starting a small farm. And where did I come up with that crazy idea was what a lot of friends asked me. But uh, Brian, if you could move on to the next slide, please. I actually stationed in Washington, D.C. in 2008, and my wife and I went to a theater and saw this limited release movie called Food, Inc., and highly recommend it to folks if you haven't seen it. Uh, they make the premise in the movie that our food has changed more in the last 50 years than it has in the previous 10,000, uh, certainly here in the United States, uh, without a doubt. Next slide, please, Brian. That idea really inspired my wife to get out and do some of our own research here to, to really critically look into some of these issues. So we started looking into where our food comes from these days, what's in it, and how it's affecting both human and planetary health. And frankly, it's a sad story. Uh, we're in the midst of a, a chronic disease epidemic here in the, in the country, and healthcare costs have risen in excess of $4 trillion a year, and we're certainly not any healthier for it. Next slide, please, Brian. So we continued our research and what the heck's going on here is a good question. Uh, this guy did a lot of research on it in the 1930s, Dr. Weston Price. And if you asked him what was going on, he would tell you it has nothing to do with the shortage of pharmaceuticals. Uh, it's easy, uh, you are what you eat and you eat, need to eat nutrient dense foods to have any hope of being healthy. So that put my wife and I on a quest to find out more about what exactly is meant by nutrient density and where does that come from? Next slide, please. Second big takeaway from our movie was this guy here, Joel Salatin. Uh, he farms out in Virginia, USA. So we went down to meet with him. He actually raises quality food in a different manner than industrial agriculture does. So we got to meet Joel, learned about uh, how he does things, and it kind of gave us the idea, maybe we ought to try and start a small farm of our own. Next slide, please. So we did that. In 2015, we started raising uh, grass-fed beef and hogs and chickens, turkeys you see here in the picture. We've been doing that since 2015 and had a great reception from our, from our customers who really like the products. Next slide, please. So my wife and I continue to learn every day. It's a, a continuous process, but we would tell you today that at least two of the most important things uh, to human health are nutrient-dense foods and then this thing called human microbiome. Uh, you know, some of the experts will tell you there's 10 times as many microscopic critters living in and on you as you have human cells in your body, uh, which is fascinating to me. And where do those things come from? Uh, that, that begs the question. Next slide, please. So the timing to answer that question was exactly right because I've got a close personal friend 
uh, talking to her one evening in December of 2019. And she said, hey, have you heard of Dr. Elaine Ingham? And I had to admit I had not. So I immediately went out and started to research uh, Dr. Elaine and, and the, uh, I found the Soil Food Web School, signed up right away and dived right into it and, and wanted to go through the full program, which, which I did. And I, I will tell everybody out there, this was the single best resource uh, that I had yet found, you know, above and beyond all the books, all the pieces that my wife and I had studied, because this thing brought it all together. Um, it, it provided the bedrock of the principles, frankly, about where's nutrient density come from, where's soil microbiome, uh, you know, what's the role of soil microbiome. And ultimately, you, just, you find out then that you cannot possibly raise nutrient dense beef on a farm without nutrient dense forage. And you can't do that without a healthy soil microbiome. Oh, by the way, if you're wanting a healthy human microbiome, you can't do that without a healthy soil microbiome because we're essentially walking compost piles. So going through the training, you start to see the forest for the trees. You start to understand that all of this is interrelated, interdependent, uh, not only from a soil perspective, but across the entire biosphere of the earth, uh, all these independencies uh, exist. Next slide, please, Brian. So I graduated in early 2022 from the program, and I had a great opportunity right out of the chute to be a speaker at the Homestead Festival here in Columbia, Tennessee. I got to you know, walk on the stage with Joel Salatin, and it was pretty exciting for me to be a part of a lot of big names out there, uh, but to preach the Soil Food Web Gospel. About 2,500 folks came to the event. I had about 400 in my uh, tent, and uh, it was great because there was a hunger for the information, and, and folks were excited to hear about this, and uh, so it was a great way for me to start because I started to get some calls certainly right after this. Next slide, please, Ryan. Uh, what did I do in 2022? Obviously, I, I spoke there, but I also I wanted to kind of start small as a consultant to, to broaden my skill set. I had certainly worked on my own pasture, but I wanted to learn a little bit more about other opportunities like, for example, a winery or or row crops, etc. So I went to a local winery and started a demonstration plot with them last year, and, and that went very well. Uh, then I kind of stepped back at myself. Hey, how can I organize my uh, my farm, my soil facility, if you will, to be able to do uh, a little more organized work. So I, I started working on that. Uh, I have not done any advertising uh, of significance, honestly, beyond the Soil Food Web website and uh, my own farm website. That's as far as I've gone with advertising. After the Homestead event, we started to have, uh, there's a lot of people moving here to Tennessee in uh, the USA to start raising some of their own food. Uh, and they were hungry to learn not only, uh, you know, about raising cattle and, and chickens and hogs, uh, but certainly the Soul Food Web once I introduced it to them. Uh, so those folks started to show up here at the farm and it was a great opportunity with uh, the facilities we have here. We could not only show them how to raise the livestock, but then introduce them to why Soil Food Web is important uh, as part of that as well. Uh, now, Soil Food Web gave me tremendous skill set, uh, no doubt about it, uh, but I'm obviously a curious learner, so I wanted to add some more tools to my tool belt as well. And so I've been studying uh, Korean natural farming and, and some of Dr. Johnson's work. There's a lot of good work going on out there. Uh, next slide, please, Brian. In pictures, you can see I've it didn't take anything fancy for me to get started. I've got my little soil workshop there on the top left. I hauled in an old uh, storage shed in the top right there, rehabbed it. That's now my little soil laboratory that I have uh, here on the farm. Uh, we've made some of our own equipment. If you can see down there in the bottom left, that was just a little sprayer that I welded together to pull behind a golf cart. Uh, got me a good start in the demonstration plot of the winery so I could get in and out easily with the small equipment. Uh, the picture of these I probably like the best is the bottom right. We did the uh, full year of the demonstration plot in the winery. And I don't know how well you can see it, but as I was walking through the demo plot just before we harvested the grapes, a praying mantis hopped down on my hand. And I took that as though he was thanking me or he or she was thanking me for not having sprayed him with insecticide this year. Uh, so that was kind of exciting for me. Next slide, please. So as I look to this upcoming year and what's ahead for me as a consultant, uh, again, I'm I continue to be an avid learner. I just uh, finished up Jeff Lawton's permaculture design course, uh, maybe learning a tenth as much as Keisha and Casey already know about this topic, but that was a great experience. And uh, continuing to study 
always. I'm starting to study some of the structured water aspects of what we do now and, and frequencies and, and, and it, you know, it's a, it's a big topic out there. Uh, we've got year two of the local winery coming up, which I'm really excited about. They've wanted to expand based upon the results we had in year one. Uh, they'd love to see a lot more biological approach in their winery. Reached out to some local row crop farmers here, so I'm going to be helping them out, set up some demo plots as well, uh, so we can mutually learn how to how to handle it on the row crop side. And I'm going to continue to spread the soil food web gospel, of course, uh, speaking at the, the event coming up this summer as well. Next slide, please, Brian. And to kind of wrap this up, from my perspective on the soil food web community, it's uh, it's amazing, if you ask me, to be part of a large team doing very worthy work. Uh, in fact, when you start to understand the implications of this work, I can't honestly think of anything much more important to the future of the, the human race and, and the planet as a whole. Uh, I, some of the resources I used most often are the, the forums, FC and CTP forums. Uh, Keisha and Casey already talked about. Those are great. Not only that, the webinars, the annual soil summits, those have all been fantastic. Uh, the school itself has done a great job providing advertisement uh, for what I do on their website. And of course, interfaced with some great folks out there. Uh, Sammy is always great at uh, fielding calls, directing folks my way if uh, they're in this region of the United States. And I also had, uh, as Alan pointed out, some great conversations with uh, Todd Harrington, uh, Brian Bagg and others who've, uh, uh, and of course my mentor, Dr. Carla Portugal has been fantastic as well as we continue to learn together. That pretty much wraps it up. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Kevin. And I just absolutely love your golf cart sprayer. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Thanks, Brian. Um, and uh, before we move on to Casey, just a reminder for everybody, if you'd like to ask questions to the panelists, go ahead and put your questions into the Q&A section, and we will try to get to as many of those as we can. Okay, without further ado, Casey, uh, go ahead and take it away. Hello again, everybody. I'm the other Casey <laughs> in the Soil Food <laughs> family. Um, yeah, so this is this can be my perspective on our community. Uh, next slide, please. So where was I before I started Soil Food Web? Um, about 10 years ago, I was living in Chicago in the restaurant industry, and I moved home to South Texas to my family's farm. And they were in traditional agriculture for about 80 years. And I moved down and I was always into what I used to call environmentalism. And so it, I started to learn farming and then um, there was just this natural progression as, as many people do when they go down a rabbit hole. And so did organic farming and then I learned regenerative practices, um, did a bunch of permaculture work, got my PDC and permaculture teacher training. Um, and I, I did this, full circle, I did aquaponics, gourmet mushroom growing, microgreens, farm to market gardening, uh, anything I could get my hands on that was kind of in the regenerative field. Um, I knew there had to be a way to, to grow veg in soil or perennials in soil or landscapes, uh, residential landscapes without using all these nasty synthetic inputs. Um, I just knew it, but I didn't know how. And uh, that's uh, through all of my, you know, miscellaneous studies, that's how I found Dr. Elaine Ingham, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Soil Food Web School. And, uh, you know, that was that, as they say. Next slide, please. All right. So, what do I do now? Um, what I get paid to do is to work part time at a farm to table restaurant doing farming for them. Um, I care for the land, it's a couple acres. Uh, it's kind of a mixture of landscaping, permaculture practices. Uh, annual veg gardening. And then I've got two small businesses. One is the uh, consultant, I, I call it a soil health business, because um, as much as I love the soil food web and everything involved, I think it's, you know, part of the larger picture of soil health. Um, so yeah, and that's that. And then about a year and a half ago, um, I met my business partner for Vital Grow Inc. And our goal there is to create smart composting devices. So the first the one that we've developed is a remote compost temperature monitoring system. 
Um, so it's a compost thermometer that you can stick into your pile or pile, piles or windrows and they all connect to each other and review your data online. Um, it's pretty cool. It's, it's something completely different than I've ever done. Um, I'm a manual labor kind of guy and uh, you know, I just work really hard and this is different uh, in the same vein and you know, I would have never been able to do it with all of the training. Um, from the Soil Food Web School, but it's it's been it's been a fun endeavor. Um, yeah, next slide, please. How do you feel about what you do? Um, oh, I realized I, I've got all these like fun little images. Um, I, I hate taking pictures, so <laughs> I don't have any real pictures. Just fun, just fun graphics. Um, but yeah, I absolutely love what I do. Um, it took me a while to narrow down my focus in this larger field and, and figure out what I really wanted to do. Um, agriculture is my favorite. It's, it's what I started doing. It's, I love growing food, um, but soil health in general and soil food web is so much larger than that. And so I feel like I can make a larger difference just focusing on, on soil care in general and have a, a larger positive impact for people and other animals and the environment as a whole. Uh, so it's really nice. And I used to be kind of timid uh, about my time and my experience. And then I, I just realized, you know, when, when you really dive into something that your feedback is valuable. And so I'm, you know, happy to, to put all of my time and energy into this. Um, but there's also a lot of continuing education that goes along with it too. All right, next slide, please. What is the best thing about this work or about my job? Um, my favorite thing, hands down, is that it never gets old. Um, there's always more to learn. Uh, you think you're kind of getting a grasp on things, and then you turn around and you're like, oh, wait, there's more, um, which is, is kind of daunting at times, but it's great because it's um, like a never-ending learning process. It's, it's unlimited, literally. So you're like, whoa, this is so cool, um, almost every single day. And uh, there's also a lot of varieties. And you know, this started out as a hobby for me. And like any hobby, the deeper down you go into the rabbit hole, um, you know, the, the more you realize you can keep learning about it. But the cool thing about so soil food web and soil health in general is that it's such a new field, relatively speaking, that um, we don't know you know, 98% of, of what there is to know. And, you know, it's that, that old saying, we don't know what we don't know. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, this is, a, I think for me, one of the most important questions. Um, am I able to make a living doing this work? And the honest answer is that no, not even close. But then, you know, there's an ellipsis, it's not yet. Um, I know I can get there. I know it's possible. And there's, you know, I'll be talking about it in a moment, but there's plenty of support here. And, um, but you're an entrepreneur as well. And just like an entrepreneur in any industry, um, you know, it's, it's, there's going to be some hurdles to, to get over. Um, but the main takeaway, I think, for me, uh, for answering this question and for anybody listening to this, as it relates to the previous question, is that the field is wide open. Um, it's overwhelming and kind of frustrating and daunting at times. Um, but with that being said, there's unlimited area of growth and areas to pursue within the field. So you can learn a lot about the soil food web and then choose whatever you want to do. And there's probably few, if any, people doing it in your area. So it's incredibly open and it's, it's an amazing thing. Um, you know, you can do landscaping, you could do consulting, you could do farming, um, pretty much anything within the field. So it's super exciting. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I know it's just around the corner where I'll be able to do this full time as a living um, and uh, just takes a little, a little more time and effort. Next slide, please. So the soil food web community, what is it like? How does it feel? Um, it's super exciting. Um, it's, it's hard sometimes, again, but it's very fulfilling. Um, I mean, we're at the forefront of a movement. Uh, the more you 
get into the field, the more you realize that um, we're going towards soil health and more natural ways of caring for the land and further away from um, synthetic chemicals. And so being at the forefront of a movement, there's statistically not that many people that can say they're, they're at the front of it. And that's what we're doing here. Um, so it feels incredible to be a part of it. And the, the community is relatively small speaking, um, but it's, it's growing and it's growing fast. And so um, everybody that I've interacted with within the community or um, you know, farmers even, um, everybody's happy to be learning together. And it feels nice to have colleagues and friends and, and people that you can interact with online. And so I love the community. Next slide, please. All right, how do I interact with this community? Ah, oh, in every way I can. <laughs> <laughs> I really try to soak up uh, information, um, you know, wh wherever I can. And uh, I personally don't want to be an armchair practitioner. Like I like to get, like I said, I'm, I, I'm a, a kind of a workhorse. So I like to get out there and do it. Um, and then I try to pass along that information to others. Um, so yeah, like I try to be an open book. Um, so specifically, I, I interact with uh, experts and colleagues online mostly um, through all the little little groups that we've created um, as a whole. And then I actually have a local meetup group uh, that I call the Soil Health Nerds that we get together every month and um, just learn from each other, discuss, socialize. So it's a lot of fun. Next slide, please. Who do I go to for support? So again, it's all the little uh, groups. Um, there are plenty of social media uh, groups out there. It's not really my thing. Um, so that's not where, where I search, search them out, uh, but there's those available. There's Soil Food Web School um, hosted groups, uh, like the, the escape group, the forums, um, and then anybody who contacts me, you know, we start our own little groups too. Um, so yeah, when you get to a certain point, uh, get really deep down, there's less and less people that you can rely on. But again, it's the, the community is growing and we're, we're becoming a larger community where there's always somebody to turn to, to ask specific questions. And like, everybody's got their own viewpoint as well, right? So it's, it's great. Um, yeah, and then anybody that I have connected with has been super knowledgeable and super awesome. And, you know, the, the different perspectives and thoughts and ideas um, really help me personally, because sometimes I get pigeonholed. And, uh, you know, hearing somebody else's uh, perspective is, is really helpful. Next slide, please. So who gets support from me? Um, and this is, <laughs> this is completely on this. Anyone who contacts me, um, I, I do value my time more now than I probably ever have in my life. Um, and it's hard to be available to everyone all the time. But uh, I've had situations in the past where I was just learning something or I was really interested and I, and I reached out to, to somebody who I considered an expert in the field and they kind of gave me the cold shoulder, shoulder or like brushed me off. Um, and that kind of put me off. So I try to be as open and encouraging and generous with my time um, as I'm able to. And so I'll, I'll interact with almost anybody who contacts me. Um, and all I ask is that for the people that I help and, and I'm generous with my time too, that they return the favor uh, when they're more experienced and, and people, you know, come to them to ask questions, uh, you know, just, just, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to give all your time, but just a little bit here and there. And I think it, it feels good. Um, so yeah, don't, don't hesitate. Uh, next slide, please. This is my last slide. And so what part does the Soil Food Reg School play in my daily life? Um, it plays a big part every day. Um, I interact with students, literally every day. And that's part of the ongoing um, education, which I, I greatly appreciate. Um, the staff is, is always there to help. Um, in particular, Dr. Ingham, she's one of the busiest people I've ever met. 
but the the extremely exciting and kind of crazy thing is that she's so generous with her time towards her students um, when she does have it. So any any time she can offer advice, she will. And I've never met a teacher who is also more patient with their students. Uh, sometimes you see the the same questions being asked over and over and over again, just by new new people, um, and she'll answer the same thing over and over and over with updated knowledge. Um, and she doesn't get mad. She doesn't get frustrated. She just like it, you can tell that she loves it, and it's great. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful for Dr. Elaine and, and the school in general, and it's been a great experience. Um, yeah, and that's it for me. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Casey. Um, great to see your uh, your journey. And then I agree with you about Dr. Elaine. She's been very, very generous with her time, and and it's so good to be able to have access to uh, to somebody like her. So. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and talk about uh, my journey. And um, I'm Brian Vag. I have a consulting company called Sprouting Soil. And um, you know, when did I really kind of discover Dr. Ingham? Um, it was, oh, shoot, I think about seven years ago now. Uh, my wife and I, we had a five-acre homestead in Northern California, and we were growing our food, but very conventionally. I grew up on a homestead, and but my parents. They tilled the soil, we applied uh, fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, all those kind of things. And that's what I mimicked when I first went into our homestead. And um, really every year since you know the beginning when we started planting plants, it was more problems, more inputs, you know, the typical kind of on the agrochemical treadmill. And I really just one day started looking at some of the products that I was applying to my plants and realizing that I was eating those things. And I really just had to put a stop to that. Um, and so I really started down the permaculture route first. Uh, that's how I really started looking at the design science of, you know, not tilling the soil, multi-story, you know, planting systems, food forests, you know, things like that. And I really just started to see, you know, results, great results uh, on our homestead. Um, but it didn't really connect all the dots for me. And it's kind of funny, a lot of us have already mentioned that we read a book called Teaming with Microbes. <laughs> and yeah, I read the Teaming with Microbes and in there, Elaine writes the foreword to the book. And in fact, I remember this very distinctly, I, I read the foreword, I stopped, put the book down and I looked up Dr. Elaine Ingham and that's really how I, I found out about her um, and thought, okay, I need to be able to to learn more. She had a, you know classes going on and that, that's how I started this journey uh, into the soil food web. Um, and then, you know, just continuing education, you know, looking at different um, sources of materials, you know, uh, Alan had, uh, I'm sorry, Kevin had put uh, quite a few uh, movies and books and things like that. And in fact, quite a few of those I've already read or watched myself. Um, and so just, you know, broadening my knowledge as much as I possibly can. And, and that's really kind of how I started down this, this road. Um, and then, you know, one of the big inspirations for me was just really seeing how much our property transformed. Um, it was amazing to see um, the wildlife uh, come back into our homestead. Um, you know, when we stopped using all those chemicals and we really started creating these very productive, you know, food systems and food forests, Boy, the amount of amphibians, frogs, and salamanders, the reptiles, and the the different types of birds. It was just really crazy to see. Um, and then, and also insects, massive amounts of beneficial insects really just, uh, you know, coming to our property. And, you know, really seeing that and making those observations was saying, all right, we're on the right track. And then we started connecting dots, um, you know, as far as, how does the a healthy soil food web translate into very healthy, vigorous plants, which then translates into a, a very healthy ecosystem? Um, and it was those connecting of dots that really pushed me to go down this route. At this time frame, I was still working full time for a very large uh, computer company. Um, you know, I've been in the computer sciences realm for my career. I've been you know two, over two decades you know doing this kind of work. And I really felt like, wow, this is something that, that I think I can learn a lot more about and uh, something that, that I think I want to transition into doing. Um, and that's really what kind of pushed me into to moving down this route. 
So my wife and I, we created a business. Uh, we called it Sprouting Soil, and um, I worked actually part time, um, you know, put, putting together our business as I was transitioning out of my career in high tech. And, and really, I, I worked both businesses for about two years. Intense, you know, working full time, plus also trying to, to start a new business was a really, really intense period of time frame. Uh, but for me, it just made sense uh, that I wanted to make sure that I could make a viable business out of this before I transitioned out of, out of that career. And when I realized that I could, um, then I really made every effort I, I could to 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 do that. And, um, you know, it really for me it started slow because probably I was running my business uh, part time. Um, but the way that I really was able to to get clients was by starting to speak at local events. Um, you know, at, at grower groups, at farm conferences, wherever I could talk about the soil food web. Um, and this, I mean, was from just homeowners, you know, people that had maybe backyard gardens or just landscapes, all the way to professional grower groups, you know, people that were, you know, winemakers or to orchard farmers or whatever that grower group would be. And, you know, a lot of those speaking engagements didn't translate into any kind of business, but some of them did. And it was fine. I, I, I was quite okay with being able to, to provide that, that level of, um, you know, information uh, to those communities, even if it didn't translate into having a client. Because um, one, I want to be able to, to hone my skills by, by being able to present these topics to folks. Uh, but I also think it's really important that more people understand this. Um, as part of, you know, doing good as far as being able to, to get more people excited about soil biology and soil food webs and so forth. And then, you know, today uh, I would say my business is thriving. I've got uh, quite a few clients across a really large spectrum of growing systems. Um, I've got residential clients, small market gardens, um, annual farmers uh, to very large perennial systems, you know, orchard systems, nut crops or uh, citrus, um, you know, a lot into kind of large scale agriculture. And then I'm also doing projects with uh, forest restoration and you know, eco restoration you know, projects. And also helping companies that are creating biological products, you know, doing testing and things like that. So really, you know, I've taken a very generalist approach to how and what kind of clients do I actually, you know, take on. And I haven't had to do really any kind of marketing. You know, the school does marketing for me as far as by having my name um, and, you know, my profile on their website. So I've got a number of clients coming that way. And then also just a lot of word of mouth, you know, one farmer talking to another farmer. Uh, farmers, you know, a lot of times they like to keep things kind of close to the vest, but if they're doing really, really well, uh, other farmers will start asking them, well, how, what are you doing? Why is it so different? And, and, um, and so I've got, you know, a lot of that kind of business as well, you know, what farmers talking to other farmers. And then uh, my wife and I decided to sell our homestead in Northern California for many different reasons. And we moved to the central coast of Oregon. And so I'm, I'm building a business up here as well. Um, and really, in, in, I guess in reality, I've got a lot of clients all over the United States um, and then also some international clients coming on board as well. So, um, you know, locality isn't as important, um, you know, especially when you're going to be dealing with some of the larger scale clients, that you, you know, you can fly in or travel to and do those kind of things. Um, I do find that the work is very, very fulfilling. Um, it is a never ending story of learning. I think Casey mentioned this was, you know, when working with clients, one of the things that you get to see is their operations and you get to learn uh, what they're actually doing. And, you know, I had grown almond trees on my homestead, but I was never an almond farmer, but I have a lot of clients that are in that nut crop, um, you know, category. And now I know a whole hell of a lot about how almonds are grown and how they're harvested. And, and it's just kind of fascinating to be able to, to learn all those different types of uh, production systems. And, you know, for me, I'm a very curious person. Um, so I like to to you know, look at research and see how things are changing. And this is a, a very dynamic environment. There's a lot of new science that's happening and a lot of new information is coming out. So it's, it's just fun to be able to see um, and experience uh, you know, what those changes actually are. And then it's 
great to be able to make a living uh, for the work that I do. Um, and, you know, one of the, I guess, challenges, you know, and I think a couple of other consultants have mentioned this is, you know, running your own business is probably the toughest part. Once you have a passion for going out there and actually, you know, doing this work of making compost or applying the amendments or, you know, specifying equipment and doing those kind of things, um, I really find those to be the easy parts of the business. It's the running the business that becomes the, the tougher part. You know, I, I came from an environment where I never was a business owner. I always had worked for other folks. And so, you know, getting that set up and started uh, was, I think, more of a challenge. And also adjusting to the, sometimes the seasonality of the work. Um, you know, for me, with the, the clients that I have, it is really late winter, early spring, all the way through midsummer is just really, really slammed. Really gets slow it, towards the end of summer, early fall, and then picks right back up again in the late fall time frame. And then over winter, we, we definitely get slow as well. And so, you know, you really got to look at ways to be able to, you know, what do you do during those non-busy times? And sometimes it's great to have, oh my gosh, I got a couple of weeks where not much is going on. I can kind of charge my batteries and do that kind of thing because it gets pretty intense in that spring, spring time frame. But you also got to be able to find ways to be able to still support your business uh, during that seasonality of that work. Okay, and so what's the future hold uh, for myself? Well, uh, as Keish and Casey mentioned, um, you know, we have combined our forces. Uh, we're combining our consulting companies into a new company called Soil Matters. Uh, and it's great because that gives us the ability to scale. Um, you know, we really want to be working on some of the very, very large scale projects. And having three of us, um, especially we all seem to have different skill sets too, or at least, you know, we're really geared towards different areas of the business. And that gives us a lot better reach, I believe. Um, and so, you know, we want to be able to grow this. Um, we're hoping that as we start to take on these large scale projects that we'll actually be able to hire and train new consultants um, to bring them into the business as well. Um, and, you know, as part of this too, is when you get into large scale agriculture, you know, there's a lot of, about efficiencies and, and how do you really take a, a very low profit margin business and make them more profitable? And a lot of that's about developing practices uh, that make it very easy for the clients to be able to transition to the biological farming side of the house. And so we want to be able to hone those things um, so that we can make it much, much easier for our clients to be able to make those transitions. Um, and then also be part of the research that's shaping our industry as well. You know, we've got a number of clients that, that want to push those boundaries or they're creating products um, and being able to assist them in that process um, is good as well. It, you know, in, in reality, uh, there's so many different areas that we can be, you know, working on. There's a lot of ecosystem restoration projects and things like that that I think will be fascinating for us to be able to, to do. So the door is wide open. Um, and I'm really happy to be working with Keisha and Casey. Um, you know, it, it's going to be one of those things where um, we're very much of a like mind. We work very well together. And um, I think by, by combining forces, we'll be able to do some really, really good work out there. All right, let's also talk about community. Um, I think it's really good to be able to either join or build a community of like-minded folks. Um, I think it was Casey was talking about, he has this local soil nerds that he goes out to. We created something in Northern California called the Sierra Soil Biology Association. Uh, that picture that uh, Keish and Casey put up with, uh, you know, we were in the lab, there's a bunch of us that were uh, there at that workshop. Um, that's really what, what created the basis of that community. And I tell you what, um, it is just really refreshing to surround yourself around people that have that same passion um, and also different points of view. And, you know, we could get into a lot of discussions around soil biology and it just broadens your scope and your reach as far as knowledge that's out there. So really try to find those people that are, are in that, you know, kind of like minded um, and it, it's great if you can find them locally around you. If not, you know, today's uh, technology makes it so that you can join a community of folks that could be international and worldwide. Uh, but do, try to find that community. And, and the school provides a lot of that too. You know, there's, there's the forums. Um, we have, you know, monthly webinars and things like that to where you are able to talk and discuss, uh, you know, amongst other folks that are in that program as well. One of the things I really also uh, tried to mention to a lot of people that are either becoming consultants, are consultants, or thinking about that, 
is don't be afraid of competition. You know, I came from the computer industry when it was, you know, really starting to take off. You know, it was really in the late 80s, um, early 90s when I really started into in my career there. And um, at that time frame, it kind of feels like this. Um, there's a there's so much opportunity space and not enough enough people actually doing the work where, you know, I wasn't, you know, you shouldn't be afraid of competition. You more look for cooperation and I call it coopetition, you know, where, you know, you want to be able to, to maybe talk with other consultants about your projects and not worry about them, you know, either taking your ideas or your clients, you know, there's just so much opportunity space where it shouldn't be a problem. There should be enough clients for us to be able to, to, you know, to be able to share that knowledge. Um, and also really communicate with your peers. Uh, there's a lot of times when, We'll, I'll reach out and ask a question of either Keisha or Casey or Todd or, or, or Nick or other people that I know that are doing consulting work um, in hopes that, hey, you know, have you ever come across this before? And if they have, great. And a lot of times, you know, when people reach out to me, I'll share that information freely, um, especially if it's a small interaction. They're like, you know, hey, it took me 15 minutes to answer your question. Great. Uh, there's other times when it really turns into a business opportunity where you know a peer of mine might be working on a deal and they realize that I have certain skills that they don't have and they may hire me as a subcontract or their client may hire me uh, as a contractor to fulfill a specific niche role because I have those experiences. In the same time frame, you're also helping teach that other consultant you know, some of that knowledge that I have um, working on their project. So really, I, you know, I think try to get that whole competition thing out of your head, especially at this phase of where we're at, um, look for much more of a cooperative type of thing and, and really bring in your peers and, and have those very open, honest discussions. Okay, um, so I wanted to thank you everybody. Uh, uh, and, you know, it's, it's good to be able to share our knowledge. I, I love hearing from our, my, you know, my other colleagues out here um, and sharing their experiences. And it's kind of amazing how similar a lot of our stories actually are. So, all right, um, with that, we are going to go ahead and move on to our next part of the webinar. And we're gonna talk about our January promotion. And, and really, we're, I'm gonna show you a video here in a, just a minute, uh, but we have very significant uh, discounts right now um, on our BioComplete Compost Bundle and the Consultants Kickstarter Bundle. And the video is going to explain a lot more about that for us. So let me go ahead and start our video. When we're talking about the soil, we're talking about the base of everything. Even our health depends on the health of the soil. All the sickness and disease leads back to where you live, how you live, and, and what you eat. People don't want to use the chemicals, but they don't have any other way. It's not a desire problem, it's a knowledge problem. Everyone needs to have some awareness of what our Earth is experiencing right now and how we can make a big change. I find that this information hasn't been taught to me and I had to get off my high horse. And even though I have a PhD, I feel like I'm totally undertrained. I feel like I'm learning more with this program than I have with in-person classes in the past. I've taken classes on microbiology before, but this course really makes a difference in the way that a story is put together that unveils the relationships between plants and all those beneficial organisms that we just cannot see without a microscope. If you're looking for something that does a deep dive into soil biology, this is it. It is just an incredible knowledge base and is really relevant to what's going on right now in the world. Without it, the only way I could have gained this knowledge would have been by dropping my life and going to graduate school. And that just wasn't realistic for me. But Soil Food Web has made it possible for me to build a meaningful career in land restoration. I was really nervous. I was gonna put quite a bit of money down and not get that bang for my buck. But once I actually got into the FC courses, I was incredibly impressed with how professional they are and actually the level of education you receive. This is the career path I've been looking for in the biological community and I was having trouble finding. Buen día. Salam. Ciao. Bula. Wagwan. Bonjour. Merhaba. Kamarjopa. Barev Kia ora. It's absolutely amazing to me 
that there's people with their same approach to life wanting to do better things all over the world. What the course is doing is actually getting those people together. We don't have enough In terms of the connection to the network, I have found just an environment of camaraderie and cooperation. They want you to succeed and they bend over backwards to give you all of the resources to have you succeed. At the Soil Food Web School, we train farming professionals and ordinary people who are passionate about the environment. Our students are able to help make a real change to the way that food is grown in their communities and to how the earth is being treated. If you're interested in joining the Soil Revolution, this is a great time. We are making the Consultant Kickstarter bundle available for the final time at the price of $38.70. With the Consultant Kickstarter Bundle, you can register for the Soil Food Web Foundation courses with Dr. Elaine Ingham for just $38.70, saving over $1,100 through January 26th. You'll also get Stage 1 of the Consultant Training Program totally free, saving a further $15.40. That's 26 hours of mentor time dedicated to helping you make your own biological compost and develop your microscopy skills to the standard required to qualify as a Certified Soil Food Web Lab Technician. You'll also get two free bonuses with this offer, the Introduction to Permaculture course by Graham Bell and the Soil Sponge Regeneration Workshop with Dee Dee Pursehouse, saving a further $500. The total value of this bundle is over $7,000, for which you'll only pay $3,870, saving you over $3,100. That's 45% off. Remember, this is the final time that the Consultant Kickstarter Bundle will be made available at this price, and there are limited places available, so please don't delay. Finance options are now available, so you can pay at your own pace with a firm. Register today. Okay, um, with that said, I uh, hope to see more folks sign up for the program and see you guys on the forum and, and so forth. Uh, we're going to move to our Q&A section of today's webinar, and this is really, we see quite a few questions have been posted in there uh, asking us about uh, kind of the work that we do and some other topics. Ooh, I got to, sorry, refresh my screen here. All right, panelists, if you can, go ahead and take yourselves off mute. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start to going through our questions. The first question comes from Nicole, and the question is, how did you convince your first client to try the Soil Food Web approach? Who wants to take this one first? All right, I'll go for it. Um, we, we were lucky and we didn't have to convince anyone of anything. Um, <laughs> uh, with, our, with our compost business, we actually, um, we got a little bit of, of notoriety and we got out in, online and started talking to people on Instagram and Facebook and you know just uh, getting out where we could. And um, so our first clients actually just came to us because they'd seen us on a webinar or they'd seen us talking somewhere and um, they already had an interest in the soil food web. So it, it can be a challenge to actually try to find somebody and, and you know, convince them to change their mind. Um, yeah, I think a lot of it really is like putting yourself out there um, instead of trying to go down, hunt somebody down and change their opinion is just put your ideas out there, put like how you're feeling about it at like say conventions or, you know, hosting some kind of a workshop and just put those ideas out and people will come to you. I think, um, especially when you're getting started, wasting your time trying to change someone's mind is not something that I think you should be investing your energy into. It's really trying to find that community of people that are already interested in what you're doing and just making them known that you work in that field or that that's something that you do. Casey, other Casey? Yeah, I would, I just want to second what Keisha and Casey were saying. Um, I, I found my first client by, when I was working at a, a local uh, plant nursery and I would just probe certain um, customers verbally when I could tell that they were maybe kind of interested and started talking to them. Um, so yeah, it's a lot easier to, to, you know, turn someone's head your way if they already have some semblance of an interest versus you know, it, it's just, it, there's more bang for your buck as far as the energy and time spent um, versus trying to convince somebody of something when they don't want to hear it regardless. So yeah, that's how I got my first one, just kind of, you know, chatting with people here and there. And once I could tell their eyes weren't going to glaze over when I started talking, then, then I went for it. So. 
Kevin? Uh, well, from my perspective, Brian actually gave me the idea in one of the webinars probably, I don't know, a year ago, where he talked about having a presentation that he would use with new clients. And so through the years, uh, what you saw today in my, you know, 10 minutes was a very abbreviated form of that. But I put together a presentation that can vary between a half hour to an hour where I try to tell people and link it. Well, what I really want to focus on is the why. Why should you care? about soil health. Uh, and so I reach out to things like uh, human health and, and give them the statistics about the sorry state of affairs today and uh, march them down that path. And it's been pretty successful. Uh, I agree with, uh, you know, Casey and Keisha and Casey. Sometimes folks are hard to sell, but uh, in my case, it hasn't been a hard sell. I've walked them down that path of you are what you eat. Here's where the health comes from. And oh, by the way, if I'm talking to a farmer, uh, you know, you got to jump right to the bottom line because they're a business. And, and even though they may care about saving the world, they first and foremost care about paying their bills next month. So if you can explain to them that, hey, we give up all your chemicals, that's going to be cheaper. And, and they will very quickly understand that because they probably know their chemical costs each year. So I try and encompass that whole thing, if you will, and, and make it you know, however much time they'll give me, half hour to 45 minutes. And so far, that's been pretty successful, at least in, in my neighborhood here. You know, another thing that I think that, that helps a lot, at least with my first clients and all these clients, um, is to really also go through the process of creating a demonstration or trial plots. Um, and I think it really does two things for the client. One, it proves to them that what you're talking about is going to impact their environment. Uh, and then second, which I think is actually the most important aspect of any trial, is that at a small scale, they get to experience and learn the changes that they're going to need to institute in their farm. And they can do that at a small scale. Really think about then how are they going to be ramped that up to a large scale into their property. Um, and so I think doing trials is a really, really good way to help convince clients. And, you know, I, I've had a, a number of clients that are just gung ho from the start. You know, they, they fully believe in the soil food web. They want to make those changes. And I will even try to convince them, say, let's not convert your entire operation day one. Let's do a trial. And I want you to learn what those management changes are going to, to look like on a small scale before we, we actually transition you on a large scale. So I think uh, trials is a really good way to go about it. Okay, Alan, did you have anything else you want to add? Yeah, I kind of want to, want to build on what Brian said because it's funny. I, I uh, since I've been certified, I've had people contact me who want to consider transitioning into this career path. And like this one fellow called me, and he was in a in a rural part of North Carolina, and he was saying that many of the farmers in that area are very very conservative. They're old school. They don't believe in this and all that. And and he goes, okay. so he's kind of in an area where it's kind of an uphill battle. And I said, well, we're do you have a farm that you actually live on or work on? He goes, yeah, it turns out I do have a farm. I said, well, then what you need to do is make your own farm a biocomplete uh, operated farm where you're using the biofleet, you know, soil food web methods and then document everything, write blogs, and you'll have your own, your own self-made testimonial and you'll be able to have a demonstration farm that you can show other local farmers that are hard, kind of hard-headed and maybe old school and need to learn, but you've got to have uh, real world examples and if there's none in the area, then you got to create one. So, Agreed. Yep. Okay. Anything else, uh, panelists, before we move on to the next question? All right. Question number two. Uh, this is from uh, Agadu. And this is, who are your major clients for consulting on SFW and compost, public organizations or individual farmers? Okay. Who wants to take this, panelists? We can go first again, I guess. Um, you know, we work with a lot of different people. So with the composting and the consulting, um, we work with public organizations. The city of Reno actually started, um, they purchase our compost and make their own compost extracts um, to do, you know, some of their landscaping. They traded their chemical budget to do that, their pesticide budget. Um, that was a pretty big deal. We've got a lot of individual farmers that we work with that either buy our compost or use our services. And then it's, you know, compost producers, um, gosh, Christmas tree farmers, veggie farmers. Some, sometimes like when, when we're going to the, um, I'm looking for the word farmers markets. Most of our clients there are people that have tiny gardens on their porch. And so between both businesses, we actually service almost 
almost any growing system that you could think of, even houseplants. Um, we've got we've got clients that are that are in that realm. Um, yeah, I'll, I, you know, as I kind of mentioned in my presentation, really, it's across the board. Um, there are some government organizations, but I'd say the majority of people I work with are going to be farmers. Um, I would say that's majority of my revenue comes in is from more uh, large scale agriculture. Um, and that's you know changed a little bit from when I first started. When I first started, it was much smaller farms, residentials, you know, individuals, you know, that type of thing. Uh, but really, it, it spans the gambit for me. One, one, one thing I can add is that I say most of my clients are small, small farmers. I mean, I say small, it could be, it could be like a five acre farm up to like a 40 acre farm, maybe. Um, some, you know, of course, in Florida, you've got a lot of different industries. You've got citrus, you've got blueberries, a lot of things. So I'm kind of covering the gamut there. Um, and, I, and I did have a, a very large federal client kind of reach out to myself and some others. So that's going to be an interesting project. Um, we are, you know, we are doing some stuff where, like in Florida, one of the biggest problems we have is citrus greening, which is a disease that there really is no cure right now. They've come up with it works for a, a debilitating, deadly disease for the citrus industry. However, there's a consortium of, of soil biologists that are in different aspects that are farmers that are doing uh, and some, some, some land amendment companies that are starting to team together that really are solving this from a biological point of view. So that may morph into something that may be community minded. Um, but um, but it, as, as you, as you, as it's almost like the more you do some private projects, the, the more the public agencies find out about it, and they want to be kind of a part of it because there starts to be a con, uh, kind of a convergence of ideas and methods that solve some problems. So it's kind of interesting how the whole thing evolves. Great. Kevin or Casey, anything else you guys want to add? I mean, I, I work with what's mainly small scale right now. Um, I, I, I feel like that's kind of one of the best ways to start. And then the more experience you get, uh, you can start working on larger scales. Um, you know, I've got a, a project in Northern Texas that'll hopefully scale up soon. But um, I just wanted to, to say that um, I have some residential like landscaping clients too. Um, so as much as I love ag and ag world, like that's, like I said, where my passion is. Um, you know, there's all these other uh, aspects and facets like that you can apply the information to um, rangeland. Um, I mean, the landscaping industry is massive. So um, I started to tap into that a little bit and people that have an interest. Um, but yeah, it's kind of start small and grow as your experience and knowledge grows as well. Casey just nailed what I was going to say. That's kind of been my approach is start small and uh, work with the the local uh, people, local wineries and farmers, and uh, and then have testimonials to uh, spread from there. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I you know, like I said, I work with a large variety of different clients, but some of my favorite clients have been my residential clients. And it's, you know, farmers are concerned about profit and loss and, you know, business and, and those kind of things. Residential, it's a much more personal, emotional type of thing. You know, some of my residential clients, one of them, she just absolutely loves the wildlife that's come back into her yard. And she gets very emotional about it. And um, I feel really, you know, grateful that, um, you know, she has internalized that experience so deeply. And, and it's, um, it's just you know, for me, I, I always love going and working on those projects. Uh, they're, they're a lot of fun. So That's great to hear you say, Brian, because, uh, you know, I think the research I've done tells me that the highest concentrated use of chemicals per acre is in the urban environment. So, frankly, you make a big impact by turning around all those people who are fixated on a weed-free yard. For sure. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, when you work with farmers, I mean, they get down to the nth degree, the amount of ounces per per acreage, because it's all about how you can do your profit margin. A lot of residential people are like, I'll just go buy this product and uh, the direction for use, whatever. If if this amount's good, 10 times is even better. <laughs> Let me just go out there and spray it. So I agree with you. I think there's a huge change in the residential st standpoint that has to be made as well. And to, and to build on what everybody's saying and Casey Williams about the landscape industry, I also uh, got, I've been in this one landscape network group for over 10 years and I'm starting to get referrals now. And this is probably true anywhere in the country, but in Florida, we have a lot of sandy soil that compacts really well. And of course, soil in Florida and elsewhere is just a medium by which to apply chemicals and grow things to the, to the standard industry. But that works until it doesn't. And when it doesn't work, it fails catastrophically. And so when you have a, a high-end riverfront home in Florida that 
that has two hundred thousand dollars in landscaping starts to fail, and I, I've been kind of an expert witness on one project. Um, all of a sudden, they go, "Oh my God, what do I? Get? What's what's the problem?" Well, the problem is the soil, and I kind of explain that to them. And now I've got clients. I've got a landscape architect that gives me all of her work. That because what happens with houses, what they do is they have to grade around houses to kind of get even it up. Well, they they roll it and compact it and all that. And so I, I give them a whole prescription of how to what they got to do to prep the soil for not only the turf but also the landscaping. And so yes, there there is there's some business there as well. For sure. Yeah. One of my large clients is actually a very large property management company in Southern California. Um, they do a lot of it, landscaping. So, yeah, it, it any, really any growing system has the ability for us to be able to have impact, too. So. OK, let's move to the next question. Uh, the next question uh, is also from Agadu, and it's uh, really this one's geared towards Keish and Casey. How do you ensure that only beneficial microbes are in your compost? <laughs> to tee up one here for you guys. Go ahead. Knock Very out good it. question. How do we ensure <laughs> that only beneficial microbes are in our compost? Um, you know, I mean, I guess let's 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 back up. So the type of composting that we use, um, it, it's thermophilic. So uh, when we're doing our at-home composting, we might use worms or static piles, or you know, there's many different ways to compost. But when we're composting large scale. Um, we definitely, we use heat. And so what heat does is it's gonna cleanse out those, it, it's kind of like the same reason you cook your food, right? It's like, we, we're looking to that science for this, for this data on how long does the pile need to be hot for uh, the pathogenic organisms to die. And so the thing with microorganisms is if they're, if they're free living in the soil, if they're like out in their community and they're, you know, they're living off of the nutrients that are around them or having to hunt or having to not live off the body of someone else, right? If you're parasitic, you live inside of something, you're, you're planning on taking all the nourishment from them. So all of your, all of their systems are set up for taking nutrient from their host. Um, free living soil microorganisms that are gonna be, uh, put into a environment where there's really high heat, they haven't in invested in their cell structure. And so when that, when that heat comes, it actually kills them and it eliminates a lot of the pathogens, pests, seeds, and what we would call uh, you know, non-beneficial organisms. <laughs> Um, we do have to test our product. All large-scale compost facilities, facilities in California have to check for um, Salmonella, E. coli. Salmonella, E. coli, coliforms, all of these things. We get those tests regularly. We also use a microscope. Um, obsessively, some might say, we really check in. I can tell you a lot about each windrow we have. Um, I know who's got the most nematodes. I know where all the fungal feeders are. I know where the predatory <laughs> nematodes are. I know where there's more flagellates than amoeba. And so that kind of obsession and like just getting to know my microbes uh, <laughs> makes me feel very confident that, you know, the bad guys aren't in there. But when we're talking about good and bad, um, that terminology it doesn't always fit, right? There's a lot of microorganisms out there that are gonna be good guys in a healthy soil environment when there's structure, when there's plenty of community around them, um, when they have everything they need, they're not gonna be killing your plants. And so it's not like when we look at microbes, it's just like, this one goes in the bad category, this one goes in the good category, and at Catalyst Bio Amendments, we keep them separate. <laughs> it's not really like that. <laughs> um, but I, we do, we, we, all of our focus goes into maintaining a healthy, environment that's anaerobic and we really maximize aerobic. Aerobic. Did I say anaerobic? You said anaerobic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, we all make mistakes. Aerobic. <laughs> and um, we focus on diversity. And so with microorganisms, the reality is the more diversity that we have in a system, the more resilient we are. So that's that's really what we're always looking to to try to create an environment where the good guys win or where the bad guys turn into good guys or it doesn't matter what way you want to look at it um that's yeah. kind of my my yeah. well <laughs> and, you know it, it speaks to i mean in reality when you look at any soils or compost there is going to be the potential for either the beneficial microorganisms or the detrimental microorganisms it really comes down to the state and that's nature's way of hey if things go a certain way uh, we may want to take those plants out or that system out so therefore there's going to be those organisms that will do that kind of work and they'll once the state changes from aerobic to anaerobic then those organisms will then become predominant uh, but for us for healthy systems for growing plants we want to maintain those aerobic conditions like Keisha was mentioning so 
Um, yeah. Trying to mention, sorry guys. No, you did. You did. <laughs> it was just a Freudian yeah. slip. <laughs> not about elimination, right? In, right. in, in any ecosystem, you need the competitors. Um, you, you need all the little niches build, and as long as there's enough diversity, then nothing is going to take over. Um, because too much of a good thing can be bad as well, you know. So it's all it's all perspective uh, from an ecosystem view. Agreed. Uh, Kevin, Alan, anything else you guys want to add? No, sir. Well covered. <laughs> Alan, good to go. Okay. All right. Uh, let's move on to the next question. Uh, next question is. Uh, from Stefan. And Stefan asks, do you know anybody who was successful growing carrots and other root vegetables with no till and a perennial ground covers? Thank you. Um, I'll start this one off. Sure. I, I've, I've grown, um, you know, tons of root vegetables in a no till system. Um, you know, this is going to be in my homestead, you know, so it's going to be much more small scale. Um, and yeah, you, you, you definitely can. There's just different strategies that you can use. You know, you can, uh, and, and weeds are going to be one of the bigger things that people are going to be concerned about when growing these kind of root vegetables. And, and carrots are one of those particularly harder ones to grow because it takes a long time for them to germinate. They're kind of slow starters when it really gets down to it. And if you are in a poor soil that's highly bacterial um, and really full of those early successional weed species, then your, your carrots are going to struggle to compete against those. So you use strategies to be able to um, you know, to compete against those. Um, one is you can definitely create a, you know, put a mulching system down to where you're smothering out those, um, you know, weedy species and you just have the areas open for those root vegetables. Um, another is to create more perennial ground cover systems and then you just open up those areas where you want to be able to plant the carrots. Um, and as the carrots then definitely germinate and grow up through, uh, then the perennial cover plants can then grow in, you know, kind of fill in those other spaces that you just disturbed when you were making those furrows to be able to plant those root vegetables. Um, there are really a ton of different strategies to be able to grow uh, those root vegetable kind of crops or maybe those slow starter annual crops um, in a, you know, a biological system, a no-till system for sure. Uh, anybody you else? One thing I can add, I, I'm, I'm not a farmer, but I work with some very, very smart farmers. Um, and the one thing that we talked about carrots just the other day, and, and, um, and, and of course, um, the one thing that far, the carrots, my understanding, like is soil that's loose enough that, that they will be able to go, go penetrate and grow deep. And, and of course, you know, you gotta, that's why sometimes tillage is actually a good thing for carrots. But, but in terms of trying to focus on no-till because we do want to go towards no-till and promote the soil food web so um but the only comment i was going to make on the question was is no-till is fine uh as long as there's really good ample soil biology to keep the soil loose so the carrots can penetrate you can't if you have, sometimes you have no no-till with some compaction and then you got problems so um just just a, just a point that if you're going to go no-till, make sure the soil biology is really good because that that'll help loosen up the soil for carrots. Yeah, I've done all kinds of root veg as well, um, turnips, radishes, carrots, beets, uh, no-till, and uh, I'll, I'll brace for the big gasp, but you know tillage isn't always the worst thing in the world. Um, I I don't till, I don't like to till, but in certain situations it can be helpful. Um, and then when you get to tubers, uh, that's a whole nother, whole nother ball game. Um, I mean, I dig, dig them by hand with a, with a digging fork. And so that's a form of tillage, but then I mulch right afterwards and plant as soon as I can. And the soil in the last two years that I've been working on it, has gotten better and better. And that is heavily tilled area. It's just, you know, how do you manage it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that a lot where, you know, uh, and Alan mentioned about compaction is you know if it's a possibility i'll use mechanical means to break up those compactions um and i try to do it once you know one time break the compaction add a lot of soil biology that i possibly can to, then really start to build that soil structure and compaction is one of those issues you have to deal with um if you don't it's a much slower transition the biology will eventually deal with the compaction for you but if you're able to use a mechanical means like a deep rip or something like that 
to address the compaction while you're adding biology, that's usually the fastest transition that we can actually make. Okay, uh, Kevin, anything else you want to add? Not once again, well covered, y'all. Nothing for me. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, let's go ahead and move to another question here. Um, this one's from Steve. Uh, do you use compost extract slash tea for pest control on trees and in greenhouse? If so, how effective is it compared to chemical pesticides? Oh, I bet you we have tons of things to talk about this. All right, panelists, what do you say? Absolutely. Let me add it. Uh, let me add it. <laughs> we, there's so many new uh, biological like pesticides that you can use where you're actually harnessing some kind of fungi or bacterium that you can actually spray out that will help you to reduce your pest infestations. Um, one of the big ones that we use almost all the time is, um, oh my Bavaria God, Bacin. Bavaria bassiana. Thank you. Um, which will actually eat through soft bodied insects, uh, especially like worms. Um, there's so many, there's such a broad range of pests that this stuff works on. And we brew it into our compost teas. Um, a lot of these, these products will have you putting cups per gallon and we will make a compost tea, add this stuff to it and let it grow out in that compost tea. And so you're actually getting a lot more effective use of it and use, you know, teaspoons per gallon. Um, and a lot of the times with these biologicals, if they're not already heat treated or killed, you need to look at the packages. Some of them are, so you're just using the residues, which you have to kind of use the recommended amounts. But if these are actually living spores, you can put them in your compost teas, brew them, and before you're applying and the, everything's already activated and awake. So when you're putting it out, it's attacking these pests right away. Um, you just get a lot more effective use out of it. But yeah, definitely most of these biologicals are actually more effective than the chemicals I find. Yeah. Yeah, same. And also just the idea of <clears throat> starting to focus on the soil, I would say with our, our own growing experience, like we, we don't work too much in greenhouses, so it's limited, but um, starting to work on the soil, the first thing we see go is like powder mildew, you know, where, where it's just, you know, used to be a huge problem, just disappears right away. Um, aphids are way easier to control. You know, we're, we're definitely seeing a, 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 a less, you know, less of all these pathogens and pests. Although, you know, still, still some things coming through the pipe every now and again, we'll still see a few aphids on the leaves or whatever, but um, I can remember back when we used to, we've never really used chemicals, but back when we used to use the organic pesticides and I tell you, like the biologicals do work much, much, much better than those. Yeah. So the you one know, thing, go ahead. We had, I had one on the farm I work on, uh, one, one data point, and then I know, and we actually do a lot more compost tea spraying on this farm. Um, but this one specific uh, trial we did where we were, you know, again, powdery mildew, I don't know about the rest of the country, but it's just debilitating in Florida. It'll, it'll wipe out a squash, cucumber crop in no time. And, um, and this one time I, I spray compost too, I think, I think every two weeks or so on the leaves of the cucumbers and never had one bit of powdery mildew. Now that was just one data point and, I, and it didn't really repeat it at all, but everything else got powdery mildew. So, um, but yeah, so I, I think, I, I, and I know that it, we, we, we spray compost tea almost every week now on the farm because we have staff to do that. And we have no, no, we have no longer any insect problem. I wouldn't say that's a direct connection to the compost tea necessarily. It could be other things that we're doing. Um, but I know for that powdery mildew example, I felt really good that that was because of the compost tea spraying. And, and again, that's given that comp, powdery mildew is such a horrible uh, disease that that's a, it's a great uh, tool. Yeah. You know, it, it's, you know, for me, there's a, a lot of facets as far as spraying compost extracts and teas and you know, the soil food approaches when it comes to pest management. And, and really what we do, I think, fits with inside of, you know, it's considered IPM, Integrated Pest Management, which is very really a broad, broad topic. But, you know, our compost teas and extracts will have microorganisms that will um, consume you know, the eggs or larvae of a number of pest species that are out there. So you get some, some reduction in those pest species that way. Um, there's preventatives as far as like fungal diseases. Now you like, uh, Alan, you were just mentioned about spraying for powdery mildew. We pro provide a protective coating on the surface of those leaves that will outcompete the powdery mildew spores that, that try to, to uh, you know, establish and, and um, you know, consume that, that plant. But another aspect of this is that once we stop using the fungicides, the maticides, the miticides, the, all those different sides, 
then we're letting also the beneficial predators start to establish or reestablish inside of those crops. And we do this for orchards all the time. I'll use a good example. Um, I have an almond farmer and you know one of our blocks has been biological for the last three years. We haven't sprayed anything but compost extracts and teas. And we noticed that we started getting some uh, spider mites um, on the trees. And we decided, you know what, let's hold off before we apply any kind of product I mean, we're going to apply a biological product and let's see, do we have enough of a base of the predators to come in and actually deal with that problem? And sure enough, a week later, the spider mite issue started to decline. And within a couple of weeks, it went away because the predators were in that system to be able to take those, you know, um, the, the spider mites out. And so it's not just the products that we apply, but because we're changing the ecosystem that's there, it allows for the beneficials to stay, you know, and establish themselves and provide that additional pest management as well. If I, if I can add something, Brian, uh, I may sound like I'm a devil's advocate here in our group, but the one thing I want to caution everybody about is, is that uh, while I'm totally in, in, in support of the soil food web method, just be careful that don't, don't assume that this one thing is the, is a magic bullet to solve all your problems. And in the case of insect management, um, the compost tea is one aspect of your of your toolkit. However, it's a system approach because you might need to plant some some plants that attract you know uh, parasitic wasps or or uh, things like that, or or bring in good pollinators to out, outnumber the bad ones, or bring in ladybugs or whatever you got to do. And but then it's part of your whole system. So don't don't think that just spraying compost tea is going to solve all your problems. It, it will solve a lot of your problems, but don't assume that it's the only thing you got to do. There's other things you got to do too. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's part it's of an IPM. Yeah, it's IPM, right? It's integrated pest management, not integrated <laughs> right. pest solution, right? Yeah, so, yeah. It's like you said, it's a, it's a whole process. Yeah, it's not just one one and done kind of thing. Yeah. It is, it's been something that's been talked about. I've been I've been getting these questions a lot lately, and I think it's something that is a bit of a confusion, and po you know, possibly because we talk about teas and extracts so much, but a lot of people come to think that Dr. Elaine's way of working with soil is that you spray compost tea. Um, and you know, once you get involved in the school, or even if you just get involved in researching and looking at, um, you know, all the things that you can find on YouTube, you'll quickly realize that uh, it's a huge tool belt, just full of different things that we can use. And so, whereas yes, compost tea is incredible. <laughs> it's, always, it's, it's often just one, one part. To me, it's a foundational thing, but there's a lot of, like you were mentioned, there's a lot of other tools in the tool belt. You know, if I'm dealing with navel orange worm, which is a really particular, you know, pest problem with a lot of nut crops, you know, we'll go out and we'll, we'll pick a certain type of nematode. Well, we'll spray it with a compost tea. We'll make sure that that EPN, an endopathogenic nematode, is available because it does a very good job of eating the, the eggs and larval stages of that particular pest species. So there's a lot of different biological solutions that we can look at. And, and in reality, you know, as you transition those systems to getting to a really healthy food web and a healthy ecosystem, then things become in balance. You know, by the time I had left our homestead, I really had gotten to a mindset, I stopped worrying about pests. If I saw some aphids breaking out, I didn't worry about it because I knew within a, you know, a few days to up to a week, my predators were gonna be there to take out that problem and I didn't have to worry about it. But I felt comfortable because I made that transition. I went to a very, very healthy ecosystem at that point and it was the transition um, that you really have to pay attention to because your plants aren't going to be necessarily healthy or vigorous and or have the ecosystem uh, really put into place. Yeah, and, and my short addition to this conversation is that it's not magic. There's science behind it. Um, and there's a lot that the soil biology can do, but um, if all these little things aren't in place where they need to be, it's not going to solve all your problems. Um, it's not like do this and you, you won't ever have to worry about it again. And I feel like sometimes we get lost in it because we talk about it that way because it, it, it is such an awesome tool. And I mean, I get as excited as anybody else about like the benefits that we can utilize soil biology for compost extracts, compost tea, solid compost. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just one of the things. Um, and with greenhouses in particular, you know, any controlled environment is gonna be more difficult. You, you have more opportunities for things to go wrong. 
Um, so yeah, it's, you just have to pay a little closer attention, but um, yeah, there's incredible things that you can do with compost teas and compost extracts um, yep. that you can substitute for these other um, you know, synthetic products. Got yeah. Got one last thing, Brian, is that um, I think I think John Kempf uh, with me, me, with AEA, may have, you may have heard about him, but I have a, I remember him saying that there's a study where they've added they they sprayed compost tea uh, and they think they may have put in some foliar uh, amendments with that some nutrients, but the bricks uh, in the plant in, improved uh, over time with the addition of of a foliar spray with compost tea and with and with some maybe some foliar nutrients. And of course, for those of you who don't know, but when you increase the BRICS level of a plant, um, it becomes less and less desirable of a pest to consume that plant. So if any, and of course, your soil also helps there too. If you can get your soil biology, and your soil health good, your, your plant health is gonna go up. And as soon as your plant health goes up, insects don't want that. They want disease plants because they're easy to digest. So indirectly, uh, compost tea can, can actually, uh, I think maybe people can support me on this, but uh, can also help um, uh, with disease issues by, by improving the bricks. Hey, Alan, I'll just add in briefly too. I, I would agree with you 100% there from studying John Kemp and Phil Callahan and some of the others. Uh, and and I, my point would be, try not to look at it as though you're replacing an insecticide or fungicide one for one with a compost tea, because I think it comes down to what Alan was talking about there. You're reaching for the compost tea or the extract to enhance the health of the plant. Ultimately, that's your goal, not just to, you know, pound in, you know, one nail with one hammer. You're not trying to use a tool in that regard. You're trying to look holistically at the health of the plant. And I would offer just for my data points here, when I walk through my pasture now, knowing that I wanted bricks of 12 or better to ward off the insects, I'm much more observant. So when I look down and I see my white clover that the insects have been chewing on, I'm like, hmm, probably less than 12 bricks. So I get out my bricks meter and I check and oh yeah, this is a bricks of five for whatever reason out here in my pasture. The plant, the red clover, whatever right next to it that the bugs haven't touched, uh, you know, that's a 12 or higher on my bricks. Now I'm not saying that's a complete study, but that's just what I've experienced here in, uh, in my uh, firsthand observations. Yeah, my wife thinks I'm crazy. Um, I walk around with my refractometer all the time. She's like, are you just going to test everything? I'm like, yep. <laughs> and once you have that tool, it's super easy to use. Oh, man, yeah, it's it's an obsession. But it's a good observational technique, as everybody mentioned here. So, Okay, uh, let's move on to another question. Um, this question is from Steve. There's two parts to this. Uh, part one, I see that it is only one SFW consultant listed in California on the SFW Find a Consultant page. Given the size of California's food, wine, and cannabis industries, is there no other demand for SFW consultants? And then part two, Brian moved out of Northern California. Is it too costly or lack of demand or something else that resulted in moving his business to Oregon? So let me let me address part number two. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of personal reasons for, for making that move. Um, some of it was uh, some health issues. My wife was dealing with some, some very strong allergies um, and things like that. Um, and then really our homestead outgrew us. Um, you know, my wife and I are getting a little bit up there in age. My wife had, you know, retired and we had, you know, 40, 50 some odd fruit trees, uh, about an acre and a half of annual gardens. And uh, with the work that I'm doing now, I'm doing a lot more traveling. And so I was spending a lot less time on the homestead and it fell upon my wife to really try to take care of it. And it became a little bit too much of a burden. So at that point, we decided it's somebody else needs to become a steward of that, that homestead. And we were lucky enough to find uh, a couple that has three kids, highly energetic. They're doing homeschooling on the property and they moved right into our systems and are just rocking it on our property. So um, it felt good that we were able to, to hand off our homestead to somebody who could really take care of it um, the way that we had you know, for so many years. So a lot of personal reasons for me to move out of Northern California, uh, not necessarily because I didn't like California. I, I, that's where I grew up and born and raised. And I always considered to be home, uh, but it was also a new adventure for us to, to live in a completely different new climate. So so I wanted to, to just address that. OK, how about uh, part number one? I would uh, say that can't be true because we're <laughs> both listed. Oh, so there's already true. more than one. <laughs> 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 exactly. It does seem like there's just one of us because we do work together and we're married. I get it. Um, but 
even when, you know, when we, when we first started this Wealthy Book School, I thought like, I thought the kind of the same way. I was like, oh my goodness, Brian Vogg is a soil food web consultant and he's in Auburn and that's right around the corner from us. What are we going to do? This isn't fair to him. Um, so we wrote and his wife wrote us back and was just, you know, don't be crazy. Of course, let's hang out. Let's be best friends. Let's work together. Let's pass information off. Like come see our garden, come see our homestead. Um, and Brian was really successful when he lived here. He had lots of clients. Um, we actually end up you know, probably going to end up picking up a lot of them so he doesn't have to drive back here all the time because he's still here <laughs> four or five times a year seeing clients. Yep, for sure. Um, and there's plenty of room in California for soil food web consultants. There's plenty of room anywhere. anywhere. You, know, you know, in our teeny town, there's plenty of people making, you know, decent compost and we still have a compost business. Um, there's no lack of folks out there that need help. And so... Sorry. <laughs> 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 anyway um yeah there's no lack of, of of work out there even if you're still in the same area we are and like let's just put it like california like casey loves this kind of data california is like it's the size of of, of many small countries and so uh especially when you're talking about you know southern california or the bulk of northern california there's so many people um and especially like you mentioned with cannabis like we don't really even touch cannabis business anymore there's so much agriculture going on here um you could think with nut crops, veggie crops, cannabis production, you know, tree, everything. There's just so many different avenues that you could go down. So, you know, yeah. I would not go to the school because there's just two of us in uh, California. In a state of 39 million. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the, the, I guess the lack of consultants isn't, isn't the best terminology, but the, there's so few people because it's not conceptually all the information is presented really well in the foundation courses and it's amazing you really get it right away but then when you start to implement this stuff in the further trainings it's it's a lot of work and it's it's extremely valuable it's worth it whether you're doing it for yourself or for a business but it's not easy um in my opinion and that's just the reality of it and so there's going to be more and more consultants popping up um never i can almost guarantee you there's never going to be too many um you know you never say never but uh the reality of it is like it, it's a lot of work and and you have to put in a lot of time and effort um and to get to that point um so i, I think that's my perspective on like you know why in this huge agricultural area um specifically speaking about california or anywhere else you want to talk about um there's fewer consultants but um you know, I've been around the Soil Food Web at school and before that for about five or six years. And um, in the last year or so, I've seen like five, six, you know, people pop up as consultants, including myself officially. Um, so, yeah, it, it, we're getting there. Yeah, it, I think it speaks a lot to the rigor of the program, too. It's not just a, you know, pay your money, get a, a stamp and off you go. Um, you know, the, the really the the training is really meant to put you through your paces and, and and really to give you confidence that so when you go out to your first client, you've done it. I mean, you, you mean you, there is a part it's called stage three in the consultants training program, which is you're going to do a project where you're going to design the, the parameters of the project. You're going to have controls and you're going to have the test plots and you're going to take data and you're going to do all this work to prove that you're able to transform that soil food web. And it's that rigor that really, um, I think, helps provide that confidence. And so it takes a while to go through the program. And I know there's a lot of consultants in training right now. So there should be a, quite a few more people graduating over the next year to two years, you know, going through that the, the program, which will it's just great. I, I, I think there's too few of us. We really need to have a whole hell of a lot more of us out there doing this kind of work to really start to transform and push and making that, that big change. So I'm excited that, that there are a lot of consultants in training. I mean, honestly, yeah, the more people that are consulting, it's just the more minds you're actually changing. Because if somebody's anywhere that you're doing a test plot, all the neighbors are going to see that test plot and go, well, what the heck are they doing there? And they all the tent farmers talk and they'll be like, yeah, well, it was cheaper and I grew more there. You know what I mean? Right. Like it's, it's, it's spreading this knowledge. So the more of us there are, there's how many millions of acres of farmable yeah. land just in California alone. I think it's like 15 million. Yeah. And so like, if you go across the United States, it's like, it's endless in every direction right now. And yeah. more people need to be doing this. And yeah, I think 
there's literally, we're not anywhere near like that threshold of like, Oh, we've yeah. got too many consultants now out there doing it. You right. know? Yeah. The the one I, is I like, like I say, add to that is that if you, you know, this is a, the soil food web method of farming is relatively in its infancy. Um, and it, and it change happens. Uh, it, sometimes when things are happening, a new movement, it can be imperceptible at the beginning, but eventually it becomes, uh, where it becomes commonplace. A good example of that is organic food. You know, 20, 30 years ago, organic food was kind of like, ooh, touchy-feely people only ate organic food. But now it's mainstream. All walks of life, you're, they all want organic food. Now that's mainstream. Well, this, this science of soil management is going to be mainstream very soon in five or 10 years. And so the sooner you get involved, the better. Um, I know one of my clients I'm going to meet with tomorrow, um, he's a blueberry farmer, like an hour and a half south of him. Of May, he is going to be. I'm, I'm hoping with his the, all he's going to do, all the work he's going to do, he's going to be a hub for soil biology for that whole area of, um, of Florida. I mean, I'm training him to be a hub for farmers in that area. So again, there's there's a unlimited amount of opportunity right now. Um, so it's a great time to get in. Agreed. Okay. Uh, anything else, panelists? I said we tackle one more quick question, so we'll be fast our answers here. All right, so the next question is, uh, this is for the panel from Laura. Do you help conventional farmers transition to regenerative farming? How long does it take and how much does it cost the farmer during that transition period? Loss of income plus putting new systems into place. So I'll, I'll just take a, a quick crack at this. Um, Yes, we definitely help conventional farmers transition to regenerative farming. In fact, that's where I'd like to spend a lot of my energy is in the typical agrochemical kind of farm. How do we make that transition? How long it takes and the cost, it's, it's the classic, it depends. What are their current management practices and what is the, the condition of their soil? Um, and that will determine how fast and also how committed are, is that farmer into making that change? Um, you know, in one of my uh, crops that I help with quite a bit, uh, almonds is a good example. It's a difficult transition simply because of the way they harvest almonds. They shake the trees, they want, and if nuts fall on the floor, and they sweep those nuts into the middles of the row, and they require bare floors for that harvesting. Well, well having bare floors is not great from a soil biology standpoint. We want to have those floors covered, but the way that they harvest right now doesn't really lend itself very well. So it's it's a slow transition. Um, other of my clients, we've made that transition within a year to two years, significant transitions, um, and that's because their management practices are different. Um, and the cost, typically, the first year, sometimes you can exceed their, their production cost because there's some new equipment things they have to do. They're maybe also using some of their agrochemical products while they're doing the, the biology. But typically by year two and three uh, and then beyond, it becomes a much better cost profile. Um, I'll use an example again, uh, Almond is one of my clients. You know, within the first year, we were able to reduce about 60% of their fertilization costs, which is huge. And especially if you're following farming tech practices right now in the last two years, Fertilizer plus a lot of the other agrochemical products have doubled, tripled, quadrupled in price. Um, and so big savings from, from that client um, and be able to reduce that amount. So there's a huge, it depends there, uh, but by all means, we definitely do that transition uh, from conventional farmers to regenerative farming. Yeah, I guess I could add too on the cost of things is really like the, when we first roll up to a farm, it's like, what do you want to accomplish here? And then once we know their, you know, their objectives, their goals, then we can actually look at all the equipment they already have. And then we try to figure out how we can modify every piece of equipment that they already have to be able to, to in, implement what we do. Right. So honestly, that, and if you can make every piece of the heavy machinery, do what we do, what it's designed to do, but just do it in a biological way, the costs really aren't that significant and farmlands, farmers, those those red buildings is some of the most ingenuitive people on the planet. They can yeah. turn any piece of metal into something else. It's freaking <laughs> amazing what these guys can do inside of those yeah. machine shops on farms. So there's, you, you know, usually there's always a solution to modifying current equipment. We have a strawberry farmer in their first year. It's not about loss of money. They actually pulled more of a crop in their first year. We're actually able to sell it at a higher price than 
all the other farms around them. So it's actually year one, they increase their costs or they increased their um, profits. 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 Thank you. Yeah. That's an interesting one too, because they're one of these farmers that they don't, they don't really use soil tests. They're, uh, they've been farming forever and they, they, they do it by feel. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's impressive, uh, you know, how he's actually broke it down to me how much cheaper it is to go biological than to you know grow the way that they were before so actually it's our farmers that are teaching us that uh using compost is actually less expensive than using the chemical stuff even when the compost is upwards of 750 you know 800 more than that because they're paying for shipping you know 14 1500 dollars a yard um it's actually more economical to use that than to buy the asides so mm -hmm. Give us especially right now yeah. especially, especially right, right, now. right now the chemicals <laughs> have just gone through the rough <laughs> yeah only thing i would add to that uh was the demo plots in my opinion are a great segue into that as well because the farmers have those concerns that you well are uh, you know well articulated in the question but if you get a chance to get a foot in the door with the demonstration plot they can really get a you know, visual and, and a feel for what did it cost to do the demo plot relative to everything else i'm doing and what results did i see Exactly. Yeah, my, my quick comment here is uh, the the plot that I have the most data on personally is a small high tunnel. Um, and I just in in one growing season in the winter, I had a 20 percent um, increase in yield of plant biomass over uh, plus biology versus an organic granular fertilizer. So, I mean, transition can happen uh, really quickly. Yep. Great. Okay, well, let's go ahead and uh, conclude uh, today's webinar. I'd like to, uh, oh, before we do that, let me also talk about what's upcoming and then we'll give all of our thank yous. Uh, so we have a webinar next week on Thursday, January 26th, where we'll meet one of my clients, Jen Serp from Sonaterra Farms and talk about her market garden. And then uh, webinar four, which will be Tuesday, January 31st, uh, Casey uh, Ernst will be talking with his client, Corey Miller on Grass Valley Farms in Montana. So uh, that will uh, be the next two webinars in our January promotional webinar series. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and give some big uh, thanks. Uh, thank you panelists for coming on, sharing your knowledge. And again, you know, that's showing a lot about community and being able to share your experiences and answer questions. So I think that's fantastic. Um, I also like to thank the support team behind the scenes. There's a, a large group of people that really help pull these webinars off, keep us all organized. Um, and do all the marketing and so forth. So a big hand uh, uh, applause for them. And um, even though Dr. Lane's not here, I like to thank her because uh, without her, I, I don't think I would be down this journey the way I am. So uh, she's been an inspiration to me, a huge mentor. Um, and so even though she's not here, I'll, I'll still give a big thanks out to her. And a big thanks to our MC, Brian. <laughs> uh, no problem. I love doing this stuff. So. <laughs> All right. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and conclude the webinar. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Have a good one. Thank you. See ya. Don't forget to click that like button, subscribe to our channel, and ring the notification bell to stay updated with all our new videos.